News of the Times Wicked Wednesdays The Thomas Wheeler and Mary Piercy Murder Cases Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we look at a family tie of murder. August 1880 at St Albans in Hertfordshire and a harrowing tale of a brutal murder reverberated through the countryside. The tenant of Marshall Wick's farm met a tragic end, a gunshot ringing out in his own bedroom, shattering the peace of the idyllic setting. Meanwhile, two women gripped by fear, cowered in their rooms as an intruder prowled through the house, leaving chaos in his wake. A suspect is quickly found, Thomas Wheeler, with the legal system taking its inevitable course. His daughter, Mary Eleanor Wheeler, 14 years of age at the time, attempts suicide in her grief, but is saved in time. Almost exactly ten years later, and Mary is facing her own execution at Newgate Prison for a truly horrific murder of a love rival and her rival's child that was so unique it featured at Madame Tussaud's for quite some time. We take a look at the crimes committed by members of the Wheeler family some ten years apart in today's episode of Wicked Wednesdays. We hope you enjoy the show. Background Edward Anstey, tenant of Marshall's Wick Farm, had established himself as a prosperous butcher in London before relocating to Marshall's Wick in 1860, managing nearly 300 acres of farmland. Anstey, aged 68 at the time of his untimely demise, appeared older than his years. In the lead-up to the tragic event on the 22nd of August, the weather had remained fair for the preceding fortnight, keeping the farm labourers at Mr. Anstey's estate fully occupied with the crucial task of harvesting. Meanwhile, Mrs. Anstey was absent, visiting relatives, leaving the household responsibilities in the capable hands of the housekeeper, Mrs. Lindsay. As the clock approached 10pm on that fateful Saturday, Mr. Anstey retired to his bedroom situated at the rear of the house. From this vantage point, he could oversee the expanse of the yard, barn, cowsheds and the rickyard. Simultaneously, Mrs. Lindsay retreated to her own room located at the front of the house, while the young servant girl, Elizabeth Coleman, made her way to the attic. Then a report of three shots was heard, rupturing the tranquil silence of the woods surrounding the Marshall Wicks farm estate. The two women, too terrified to look, remain hidden in their rooms. The bloody scene of splattered brains is revealed early the following morning. From the Liverpool Echo, the 23rd of August, 1880, the murder near St Albans. At about two o'clock on Sunday morning, Mr Edward Anstey of Marshall's Wick, a farm near St Albans, was shot dead by a man who knocked at the door, and on Mr Anstey opening the bedroom window, the man deliberately fired and blew out his brains. A Mrs Lindsay, who was staying in the house, locked herself into her room, and the murderer ransacked the house, escaping with some booty but how much is not yet known. On the arrival of the cowman in the morning, traces of blood were found outside. Mrs. Anstey was away from home on a visit. Another account received last night says, between one and two o'clock in the morning, Mr. Edward Anstey, farmer at Marshall's Wick, St. Albans, was shot and killed, and his premises subsequently robbed by his assailants. About one o'clock a man knocked at the farmhouse door and called the deceased's name. Mr Anstey opened his bedroom window where he was instantly shot. 
There were two women in the house at the time, domestic and a lady called Mrs. Lindsay. The latter locked herself in her room whilst the man entered and ransacked the house. The women were too terrified to do anything. It is stated that Mrs. Lindsay's life was threatened. An alarm was not raised until the arrival of a cowman in the morning. The police were then summoned. Up to noon today, no arrest was made. The murdered man's brains were blown out, and the walls outside and the window are splashed with his blood. A later telegram says three men have been arrested on suspicion, all members of a family named Wheeler. The shirt and trousers of one of them are stained with what is supposed to be blood. The property stolen has been discovered hidden in a field near the house. Some property stolen from the house of Mr. Reynolds, neighbouring farmer, has been found at the house of the prisoners. The murderers, it appeared, entered the house by the bedroom window and covered the body with bedclothes. Police hasten to question the neighbourhood with a suspect almost immediately becoming known to them. Thomas Wheeler, cowman, described as a short, dark-complexioned man, very rough in aspect and being deformed with what is commonly known as a hair lip. His statement that on the night of the murder he slept in the firs at Harpenden Village near to the scene of the murder until eleven o'clock the next morning is almost conclusively proved to be false, as witnesses have come forward proving that at various hours from the very early period in the morning he was seen at various points between St Albans and the neighbourhood of Luton, and at one public house on the roadside he changed a florin in purchasing some bread and cheese. As Thomas is picked up, so are two of his boys, and all are remanded in the cells. What looks to be blood is found on the clothing of Thomas, which he explains away as pig's blood. Statements from the two women within the house recounts a harrowing take of the events of the fateful night. From the Framlingham Weekly News, the 28th of August, 1880, Murder near St Albans. Early on Sunday morning, a dreadful murder was committed near St Albans. The name of the murdered man is Edward Anstey. He was an aged farmer and lived at Marshall Wick Farm, Sandridge. His wife and family were away from home, and there was no one sleeping in the house but the farmer, an old lady, and a servant. At about two o'clock in the morning, the servant girl, who slept at the top of the house, heard two shots from a gun. She was too frightened to leave her room and remain there till daylight. The old lady did not hear the shots, but she saw a man enter her room twice after he had left. On the second occasion, she got up and locked the door. The man returned in short time later, knocked and demanded to be let in, stating that he wanted some money. The old lady refused to open the door and he tried to break it open with the hammer, but in this, however, he did not succeed. The old lady pushed a two-shilling piece under the door, saying it was all she had. Nothing more was heard of him. About four o'clock in the morning, the servant rose, and on going to Mr. Anstey's bedroom, she found the old man covered with bedclothes dead. The upper part of his head was blown away. There was a ladder against the window, and it was evident that the gun had been fired from outside. The ladder had been taken from a hayrick. On Monday afternoon, the county coroner opened an inquiry at Marshall's Wick Farm, Sandridge, near St Albans, as to the death of Mr Edward Anstey, aged 65 years. The deceased resident, which is a modern farmhouse standing in a remote part 
of a country lane was surrounded by a large crowd of persons anxious to hear the evidence, but the public could not be admitted owing to the smallness of the room in which the inquest was held. The first witness called was George Bailey, a cowman, in the employ of the deceased, who identified the body as that of his master. The witness had been in Mr. Anstey's employ for the past five years, and a previous occasion for seven years. He last saw him alive at ten minutes to eight on Saturday night, when he was quite well and standing in that room. Witness did not live at the farm. He came to his work at 4.30 on Sunday morning, which was his usual time. The first person he saw was the servant girl who put her head out of the back window upstairs. In consequence of what she said, witness entered the front door, which was open, and called out, Master! 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 But no one answered. Witness stood just inside the doorway. Mrs. Lindsay came downstairs to him. She had not been long in the house and was acting as a housekeeper. Witness asked Mrs. Lindsay where the deceased was, and she replied, upstairs, covered over. He then proceeded upstairs into the bedroom and saw what he thought was his master. He was covered over all but his feet and a little piece of one of his legs. He saw a bundle of clothes immediately under the window. He did not know who it was at first, but afterwards saw that it was his master. He observed his head and that it had been injured. When he saw a scar on the deceased's chin, he knew at once that it was Mr. Anstey. He only knew him by the scar. He was in such a state. The room had been ransacked, and the drawers had all been pulled out. The window was open to the best of his recollection, and as soon as witness found it was his master, he went to look if there was anyone in the house. All the rooms were in a state of great disorder. Witness then went down and unfastened the shutters. The lamp was broken, and things were strewn all over the place. The cupboard and cellar doors had been broken open. Witness went into the passage and found a large hammer and a pot against the door. The pot belonged to the house. He then sent a boy on a pony for Dr. Webster and the police. Witness afterwards found a ladder under the back window. It had previously he had seen it on Saturday against a corn rick about a hundred yards from the house and at about three or four yards had been broken off the ladder. Witness had since found the pieces by the stack. By the Coroner When he first approached the house, the girl told him that someone had been in the house all night. Dr. Webster of St. Albans said that he had known the deceased for some time. On Sunday morning at 4.55, he was sent for and arrived at the house at half an hour later. Witness took Police Constable Quint with him. Previous to entering the house, Witness noticed blood outside the window, which, to the best of his belief, was open. On going into the room, Witness saw something covered up with clothing and found it to be the deceased. He was in a sitting position under the window, against the wall, with his legs under the dressing table. Witness removed the covering and saw the deceased head was shattered. It was caused by a gunshot wound and was fired less than ten feet from his head. Death must have been instantaneous. Witness found blood and brains on the window sill, and the blood had trickled down the wall. There was also blood on the stones outside the house. He mentioned this because it went to show that the deceased's head was far enough out for the blood to drop direct. In the ceiling there were many holes from the shot. There were two scattered to have been fired inside the window. Witness 
was of the opinion that the person who fired was standing close to the house, about ten feet from the window. The deceased could not have fired the shots himself. Witness had not endeavoured to extract the shots from the head. The coroner then adjourned the inquiry. The Wheeler family, long suspected of poaching as well as the authors of several burglaries in the area, are now investigated intently. The two boys are let go, but with the blood-stained clothing being worn by Thomas and with proven lies as to his statements of his whereabouts, they paints a damning picture of his guilt. The case goes before the magistrate at an inquest to determine if there's enough evidence to commit Thomas to trial. From the Liverpool Echo, the 3rd of September, 1880, the St Albans murder. Thomas Wheeler, charged with the murder of Mr Ainsty on Sunday week, was further examined before the magistrate yesterday. The proceedings were private, but reporters were afterwards permitted to read the deposition. Very few additional particulars were, however, obtainable, and it is said that several important points of evidence have been purposely reserved. The prisoner in his statement accounted for the blood marks on his clothes by saying that he had killed a pig for a neighbour some days before his arrest. He stated that he had not slept in a bed for a week prior to his apprehension and was not, was on tramp on the night of the murder. Dr Webster said he had examined the bruises on the prisoner's shoulders and that it was likely to have been caused by the kick of a gun. The adjourned inquest on the murdered man was held last evening when Dr Webster, who had extracted the shots from the head of Mr Anstey, was examined. Susan Gray, gatekeeper at Hatfield Road, deposed that on the night of the murder, the prisoner passed her house at about quarter of a mile from St Albans. The inquest was adjourned till Wednesday, to which day also the magisterial proceedings stand adjourned. The proceedings are adjourned for one week as police continue their investigation into Thomas. From the Liverpool Echo, the 8th of September, 1880, the murder near St Albans. The man Thomas Wheeler, charged with the murder of Mr Edward Anstey, farmer from Marshall's Wick Farm near St Albans, by shooting him on the morning of Sunday the 22nd of August, was again before the county magistrates this morning. The accused has been twice remanded on the charge of murder and also on charges of committing burglary at two parishes in the same neighbourhood. The depositions taken at the previous hearings were read over. The evidence deposed to by a number of witnesses was to the effect that on the night of the murder a man answering the prisoner's descriptions was observed proceeding towards Marshall's Wick Farm with a double-barrelled gun, and after the murder of Mr Anstey, a double-barrelled gun was found close to the prisoner's house. The gun has been identified as one stolen from a neighbouring farmhouse a few days before the murder. The accused is not directly connected with the gun, but Mrs Woollett, wife of the farmer to whom it belonged, had sworn that Wheeler is exactly similar in build and appearance to the man who entered her bedroom the night of the burglary. The evidence of the police showed that when arrested on the day of the murder, the clothes worn by the accused were stained with blood, and in his pockets shot was found similar in size to those found by the medical witness in the head of the murdered man. A further link of some importance connecting prisoner with this atrocious crime has been discovered. A witness having sworn to a small syringe found on the prisoner when arrested, having been the property of the murdered man and stolen 
from his bedroom on the night of the murder. The case is proceeding. The prisoner presented a very dejected appearance, and although through his solicitor he still maintains his innocence of the crime, appears to feel his position keenly. The formidable array of evidence already adduced seems to have considerably broken the defiant attitude presented by him at previous hearings. Interestingly, one of the most damning pieces of evidence is the florin that was given to Thomas under the door by the housekeeper. Witnesses attest that the day before the murder, Thomas had been begging for bread, yet the day following the murder, he is seen to give a florin to a shopkeeper in exchange for bread and cheese. Further evidence includes a distinct shringe that had been used for medical purposes by Mr. Anstey just the day before the murder, and now found in the possession of Thomas. Plate and goods are found buried not far from his house. The trial rolls out the considerable evidence against Thomas, and he is found guilty. On the 11th of November, Thomas confesses with a letter of apology to the widow of his victim, Mr. Anstey. From the Liverpool Echo, the 11th of November, 1880, a murderous confession. Thomas Wheeler, the St. Albans murderer, has written the following letter to the widow of his victim, Mr. Anstey. Her Majesty's Prison, Chelmsford, November, 1880. Mrs. Anstey, it is with heartfelt sorrow that I write you a few lines before I can sleep tonight to beg your pardon and forgiveness for the cruel wrong I have done you. I did shoot, Mr. Anstey. Forgive me this great wrong. I cannot ask God's forgiveness until I have asked yours. When you tell me you have forgiven me, I shall have hope that God will do the same. I have been very miserable until now, but my heart feels lighter since I have told my sin to the clergyman, although through him I tell it to my fellow men, as I have sinned against all hope. I hope all will pray with me for forgiveness through the merits of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. That is all my hope now. With God I must now try to make my peace. May he help and protect my dear wife and children, and may my sin not be visited upon them with all that cruelty with which I have treated you. Pardon me, your unworthy servant, Thomas Wheeler, his ex-mark, witness, W. F. Lumley, chaplain. Wheeler met his fate on Monday, November the 29th, at the St. Albans City Prison, situated on Grimston Road, where he was hanged. Tragically, the saga of the Wheeler family did not conclude with Thomas Wheeler's execution. His daughter, Mary Eleanor, a mere 14 years old at the time of her father's demise, attempted to take her own life by hanging from a tree in their garden, consumed by grief. She is saved and survived. We move forward some ten years. Mary Wheeler, now Piercy, as she has named herself, from a previous relationship that has soured, is now living in Hampstead, reportedly an Auburn beauty. She derives her means of living from gifts and the support from men. The crime in brief. On the 24th of October, 1890, a corpse of a young woman with her head nearly severed from the body was found by a policeman in Hampstead. The head was wrapped in a cardigan. A blood-soaked pram was found near the body. The body showed considerable bruising, indicating that the dead woman had fought hard to defend herself. 
The next day, the body of an 18-month-old baby was discovered a mile away from the original dead body of Phoebe Hogg. It was confirmed as the body of 18-month-old Phoebe Hanslop Hogg. Death of the baby had been through suffocation. It was conjectured that the baby had suffocated in the pram when the battered body of its dead mother had been placed on top of it in the pram, thereby suffocating the baby through the weight of its dead mother on top of it. The head of the mother had been severed from the body during life. Who was Mary Piercy, also known as Mary Wheeler? Mary was born Mary Eleanor Wheeler in 1866. Mary took on the name of Mary Piercy from a carpenter with whom she moved in for a short time, John Charles Piercy. John left her because of her infidelity with Frank Hogg. She kept the surname Piercy and referred to herself thereafter as Mary Piercy. Mary was described as having lovely russet hair and fine blue eyes. She was approximately five foot six inches in height. Mary did not work and apparently had no need to work. She lived in rented rooms at 2 Priory Street that were paid for by a Charles Creighton, one of her many admirers. She was simultaneously carrying on an affair with Frank Hogg, and that relationship had gone on for four to five years. The Victims Mary fell hard for Mr. Frank Samuel Hogg, a furniture remover. The clincher for Mary, it was apparently that he had printed business cards. Frank had been carrying on with a Phoebe Styles at the same time as his relationship with Mary Piercy. Phoebe became pregnant with Frank's child. Regretfully for Frank, the marriage between Phoebe and Frank took place and the child was duly born and named Phoebe Hanslop Hogg. Discovery of the Bodies At 7pm on October the 24th, a woman's body was discovered lying on a pavement in Crossfield Road by a man returning from work. He promptly reported it to a policeman. The woman's head was wrapped in a cardigan, which, when removed, yielded the blood-stained face of Phoebe Hogg, with a huge gash in her throat. The body was removed and taken to the morgue. It was found that the deceased had a fractured skull and that her throat had been cut so violently as to nearly sever the head. There were also bruises on the head and arms consistent with her having to try to defend herself. Examination of the place where the body was found indicated that the murder had taken place elsewhere. At this time, the police did not have the identity of the corpse. Later that evening, a constable on the beat discovered a heavily blood-stained pram in Hamilton Terrace, about a mile from where the woman's body was found. The following morning, the body of a small child was discovered. The 18-month-old child was found to have died from suffocation and was otherwise unmarked except for a few scratches. It was possible that little Phoebe had either been suffocated during or after the murder of her mother, or alternatively been placed in the pram alive with her mother's body on top of her, and that it was the weight of her mother's body that had suffocated her. Frank Hogg and his sister Clara reported Phoebe missing after reading about the discovery of the woman's body in the Saturday evening paper. Frank sent his sister Clara round to Mary's to ask if she had seen Phoebe, which Mary denied, but Mary agreed to accompany Clara to the morgue to see if it was indeed Phoebe's body. Mary's behaviour at the morgue was reported 
to have been very strange. Having consented to go with Clara, when first shown the body, Mary reportedly said that's not her, although Clara identified Phoebe's clothes. Mary did her best to try and prevent Clara identifying the body and became almost hysterical when the full extent of Phoebe's injuries became apparent. The police asked Mary and Clara to view the pram which Clara identified as belonging to Phoebe. A neighbour of Mary's later stated that she had seen Mary pushing the pram with a large object in it on the evening of the murder. The Investigation Police arrived at Frank Hogg's flat as he was their primary suspect. There they found a key, the latch key, to Mary Pierce's rented rooms. At Mary's rooms, police found a substantial blood stain and splatters in the kitchen, together with a blood-stained carving knife and fire poker. There were also clear signs of a struggle, with two broken windows in the kitchen. A rug showing bloodstains smelt strongly of paraffin, where an attempt had been made to clean it. Mary's behaviour became more and more bizarre during the police search. She sat at her piano, singing and whistling loudly, and attempted to explain away the bloodstains by saying that she had been killing mice, killing mice, killing mice. Detective Inspector Bannister decided to arrest Mary at this point and charge her with the murders of both mother and child. When Mary was searched, bloodstains were found on her clothes, scratches on her hands, and two wedding rings on her fingers, one of which was later identified as Phoebe Hoggs. Mary was kept in custody and appeared at a committal hearing at Marylebone Police Court on the 28th of October. Whilst held on remand, Mary was allegedly to have shared with one of the guards there, confirming that she had written a note to Mrs. Hogg and given it to a boy to take to her, inviting Mrs. Hogg to her house on Friday afternoon to tea, as she would be at home on that afternoon. Mary continued, and as we were having tea, Mrs. Hogg made a remark which I didn't like. One word brought up another. There, Mary stopped herself, possibly aware that she was incriminating herself. The Trial During the trial, the evidence of the neighbours hearing broken glass while Phoebe was visiting Mary with her baby. The people who lived in the other rooms of the house in 2 Priory Street, and the boy who acted as the messenger for Mrs. Piercy, and the women who said they saw Mary Piercy wheeling the pram covered in a blanket, now known to have contained the dead body of Mrs. Hogg and the baby child, all served to condemn Mary as guilty. The prosecutor told of the passionate attachment that Frank Hogg and the prisoner felt for each other based on letters retrieved from both homes and the relation that existed between them for five years, which commenced before Hogg's marriage to the deceased, and continuing down to the very short time before the murder, which took place on October the 24th. Letters from the considerable correspondence from Mary to Frank was read out, showing a clear passion for him. The cardigan found wrapped around the severed head of Phoebe Hogg was confirmed as having belonged to Mary's ex-partner, John Piercy, which he had left with her when he had moved on several years before. Mary remained impassive throughout the trial and gave no evidence. The defence questioned whether anyone of her size would have been able to carry out such a brutal killing. But with such overwhelming evidence, Mary was found guilty after only a 52-minute consultation amongst the jury. 
Amidst the solemn stillness of the crowded court, the judge then assumed the black cap and proceeded to pass upon the prisoner the sentence of death. He expressed his complete concurrence with the verdict and said he thought the case to be one of many instances which had come before him of the terrible result of persons giving way to prurient and indecent lust. The judge continued that he thought the prisoner had become a person of so little moral sense that eventually she had been the instrument and willing instrument in taking away the life of a woman whose only offence towards her was that she was married to a man on whom the prisoner had set her unholy passion. Mary Piercy, a.k.a. Wheeler, was hung on the 23rd of December, 1890, some ten years after the execution of her father. It is worth noting that Mary Piercy had been brought forward as a possible Jack the Ripper candidate. What if Jack the Ripper had been a female? But this has not been given any serious attention. Postscript Frank Hogg And what of Frank Hogg, the philandering husband of the murdered Phoebe and child and lover of the guilty Mary Piercy? Mr. Hogg accounted for the whole of his time on the 24th of October and said that when he went home at ten o'clock at night and missed his wife, he thought she had gone to Chorley Wood, where her father was very ill. When he had met Mary two days before the murder, she had asked if he had a half an hour to spare as she wanted to see him. He had replied no. Was this the catalyst? that it had induced Mary to kill Phoebe, we will never know. Having carefully considered Hogg's account of how he spent his time on the 24th of October, counsel acquitted him of all participation in the terrible circumstances. Despite two pleading requests by Mary for Frank to visit her, he did not and seems to have done his best to escape into obscurity. That concludes this episode of Wicked Wednesdays, the Thomas Wheeler and Mary Piercy murder cases. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are wicked, where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are frightful, where we look at crimes in a location such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. If you like this channel, you may be interested in our sister channel, Chronicle of the Times, where we offer a lighter side of Victorian and Edwardian news stories, as well as a weekly podcast of stories from authors of the day, such as Dickens, Collins, Benson and Conan Doyle. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times and I am Robin Coles.